Once everyone's all woke, woke it'll is, be great. Woke is a dangerous <laughs> word to use. I feel like people are going to mock it in the future. Woke? Woke. Yeah. yeah. I feel like using woke now, like unironically, is super slippery. Woke. Woke. Way too woke. 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 A woke joke. Let me translate woke logic again. Get woke, go broke. Disney Star Wars is woke. It's all woke culture. It's this culture of compliance. They want you to comply. It's all, that's what it's about more than anything. It's getting people to change, getting people to listen to you and do what you want them to do. I am getting so tired of this woke world. Middle of May 2022, Netflix had told its employees of the most sensitive nature that things were going to change. This is something I really wanted to talk about as I feel like it's indicative of making good media. Now, of course, there are personal preferences, but I believe you have to be flexible in nature in order to really create good stories. Not just flexible, too, but you have to have a good amount of experience as well. And in this video, we're going to talk about the various aspects of woke nature and why I think it really doesn't lend to good storytelling. Not to say that there isn't good stories that will be quote unquote woke. And even then, I don't even like using the word woke either. Anyway, this is on Netflix jobs, Netflix culture seeking excellence. Now, I've seen many people quote like articles talking about this, but I thought it'd be better if we just read the actual article itself from Netflix. Just read it from the horse's mouth. Great entertainment thrills and inspires. It sparks laughter, tears, gasps, and sighs, stirring out emotions and nourishing our spirit. Ever since humans learned to speak, storytelling has been essential to our happiness. At Netflix, we aspire to entertain the world, creating great stories from anywhere and offering greater choice and control to people everywhere. To help us succeed, we've created an unusual employee culture. This document is about that culture and how we can continuously improve as a team so that we can better serve our members. What makes Netflix special is how we, one, encourage decision making by employees, two, share information openly, broadly, and deliberately, three, communicate candidly and directly, four, keep only our highly effective people, and five, avoid rules. I can't tell you how much I agree with this. Now this is just how I like to lead things, but I do think that rules are meant to be broken, but you have to come to understand those rules before you're really able to break them. And keeping highly effective people is very important as well. I know a lot of people are gonna be like, well, well, everyone's not the same. And that's the unfortunate truth about life, that you are not going to always be the best person in your field. You have to realize and understand that you're gonna fail so many times. And there's going to be someone who's better than you and better for the job. Now, while I'm working on my mini side projects, because I have a lot of them, I have a video game, I have a card game that I'm developing right now. Uh, it's not something for print, but it's something I wanted to do as a hobby. When I look for artists, I'm always looking for like the best person possible. And definitely for leaders, being able to communicate candidly and directly is very important. To tell someone right away, straight to their face, what you need. Especially if it's negative too. Uh, when I was working as a teenager, one of my first jobs was that office job. One thing that my boss had told me is, when you screw up, when you make a mistake, you need to tell the person immediately. You need to tell them and you need to tell them to their face or over the phone. Never send an email or a text message because you're robbing them of their opportunity to be upset at you. Or even not upset. Maybe they'll understand and empathize with you. But at the end of the day, you have to own up. And if a leader can't communicate candidly and directly, how can they expect their people to do the same? and encourage decision making by employees. Another perfect thing. If you're working under someone, you should be able to make decisions or at least bring them up to your superior. But for me, I like it when the people under me are able to bring me new ideas, bring me decisions that they made on their own. I don't like it when people have to ask me, oh, can I do this, can I do that, can I do this, can I do that? I mean, of course, there's gonna be things they can't do without your permission. But at the same time, being able to come to a decision, come to a conclusion on your own is super important. Valued behaviors, judgment. Once again, I agree with this judgment. I especially agree with the last one because you should always be thinking about the long term. Don't think of gain right now. Set yourself up for future success. Selflessness. This is something I think a lot of the workers that they would call woke won't understand. Selflessness. And it's something I think modern people are forgetting too. Like just selfless nature. Especially the idea of debate. There was a great comment that I have found before that had said that people, regardless of whether they're left or right, woke or not, they end up sticking themselves in these bubbles where their views are frequently protected from challenge, leading to their minds going into a state of atrophy. When you do not seek out healthy debate, healthy challenge to your own ideas, then you cannot grow from those ideas. They'll simply keep cycling around themselves. You will never find the flaws with your own beliefs. Courage. You know, I don't think many people would think that courage is something of literally just having someone tell you the truth and accepting it. 
you know, it does take courage to accept other people's ideas, which is sad to say in this day and age now that we have to be strong and be courageous in order to accept ideas from people we don't agree with or even have the courage to say that this might fail. A lot of people are scared now and social media and the internet itself doesn't help this. It allows us to hide. And I also think um, people's ability to cope but not, not even like a funny way, but like just to deal with stress in general um, mm -hmm. is gone because stress is presented to them every moment of every day in every conceivable possible way to make everybody neurotic and depressed. You've got that situation and then you've got companies that come in and see that. And I'm not even saying that they're promoting that that should happen, but they're definitely profiting off of it because they're like, oh my God, all these people are so fucked up. Let's sell them. <laughs> Let's sell them things to unfuck themselves. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and so they're making tons of money. They love it. Communication. I think communication is a very important tool we all need as humans. Uh, if you're spending most of your time communicating with people online, I would really suggest that you go outside and communicate with people outside of your bubble because face-to-face -face communication, I think, is still the strongest form of communication. And as technology becomes better, uh, that will die out, of course. But once that dies out, I think humanity is in for a hard ride. <laughs> I'll be dead by then, hopefully. <laughs> Just people in general have forgot how to be people. <laughs> um, I, I, I know it sounds weird, but I yeah, like just the basic uh, ability to like have a conversation or get to know somebody or hang out or uh, interact in a, just a daily capacity with people is being stripped away. If it's not through a piece of technology, I think people have kind of lost that. And that's not to shit on technology. I, I love technology and I think it's great that um, it's advancing and that uh, we'll be able to use it to do amazing shit and it's great and it's convenient. Uh, there are downsides to it. And I do agree with the point about being concise and coherent. I teach people from all ranges, from children to adults, and what's really important is being able to say what you need to say as easily as possible. So when I talk to people, I always talk to them in a way I believe that they would understand the easiest. Integrity, something I don't think a, a woke employee would have. It's always good to have some integrity. Especially the part where like you'll say something about someone that you're willing to share with them. I try not to have ideas and opinions about people that I would feel like I would have to hide from them. For the most part, if I feel like I have something to say about you, I'll say it to your face. If I feel like you're an asshole, I'll say you're an asshole. Innovation. Now, I don't have too much to say about innovation because I'm pretty pessimistic about it. I feel like we've done so much to innovate already. Like, what else is there to do? I have a half glass full kind of opinion on innovation. Now, the rest of the article is, is particularly long, but there is one point I want to touch upon, and that is artistic expression. Entertaining the world is an amazing opportunity and also a challenge because viewers have different tastes and points of view. So we offer a wide variety of TV shows and movies, some which can be provocative. To help members make informed choices of what to watch, we offer ratings, content warnings, and easy to use parental controls. Not everyone will like or agree with everything on our service. While every title is different, we approach them on the same set of principles. We support the artistic expression of the creators we choose to work with. We program for a diversity of audiences and tastes and we let the viewers decide what's appropriate to them versus having Netflix censor specific artists or voices. As employees, we support the principle that Netflix offers a diversity of stories, even if we find some titles counter our own personal values. Depending on your role, you may need to work on titles you perceive harmful. If you find it hard to support that content, Netflix might not be the best place for you. And that's Netflix saying, hey, if you can't agree with the stories that we're telling, then it's time to get out. I've said it time and time again that you should separate fiction and reality by a good degree. I think immersion is fine, but escapism is bad. I think stories are meant to immerse us in the world and make us feel certain things. But at no point should those feelings ever come to the point of harming your mental health. And now in this day and age of content warnings and explicit spoilers all over the place, you can know if something that you're going to watch will harm your mind. You know, many articles that said Netflix saying get out woke people is not far off. And you know, this is only because Netflix has been mired in controversy because of a Dave Chappelle special where he makes jokes, a joke, something that is not intended to hurt you mentally. Dave Chappelle ended up getting attacked on stage because a man was triggered. A local man accused of attacking Dave Chappelle on stage says he was triggered by the comedian's jokes. Isaiah Lee says he didn't like Chappelle's jokes about the LGBTQ community and homelessness. This is the state of mind that we're living with right now, where people aren't strong enough to handle jokes, that they would go up on stage and possibly murder a person over a joke. 
I identify as bisexual and I wanted him to know what he said was triggering. I wanted him to know that next time he should consider first running his material by people it could affect. We don't live in the age of sticks and stones may break my bones but words will never hurt me. It's over. That was the first thing I learned as a child. And so now this is all spiraled into what they call the woke Hollywood retreat. But what exactly is woke? Apparently the term woke was actually coined in the 1930s but really didn't pick up steam until the middle of the 2010s. While originally the word itself was supposed to bring awareness to social inequalities, it has now become nothing more than a pejorative term used in a disparaging context. Among American conservatives, woke has come to be used primarily as an insult. In a pejorative sense, woke means following an intolerant and moralizing ideology, used to mock the over-righteous liberalism. Woke, like his cousin cancelled, bespeaks political correctness gone awry. Wokeness implying an insincere form of performative activism. You know, it doesn't stop with just Netflix firing its woke employees. Crypto firm Kraken also is giving a severance package to its woke employees as well. The CEO of Kraken, one of the world's largest crypto exchanges, has offered his employees four months severance pay to quit if they are triggered by the new policies cracking down on culture war debates in the workplace. Jesse Powell, 41, issued the company's new culture guidelines on a memo on Wednesday warning employees to stop calling each other toxic or racist and saying being offended doesn't necessarily make you right. Powell said that the new guidelines were prompted by a handful of employees sparking heated debates over issues such as diversity, pronouns, and being harmed by violent words. Once again, sticks and stones, right? But apparently words have the ability to contain violence in them, which is sort of true, I guess, but an over-exaggeration for sure. The firm writes, being offended doesn't necessarily make you harmed, and that words nor silence are ever violence. Now, I can't imagine being in the workplace where everyone is hyper neurotic, always worried about every little thing, letting their anxiety consume them, just on the thought or fear that you might be offending them. Does anyone else work in a woke field and gets through the week pretending to be a different person? I understand this isn't peak alienation, but having a government job in a liberal city, this is by far the most repressive atmosphere I've encountered. I was called out for using the word insane the other day. This week my boss apologized to us for having used the word holiday last week, acknowledging that she unfairly assumed that we celebrated Thanksgiving. I just nod along but I've already stepped on enough landmines to know I'm not favorably looked here. As a socialist, I'm committed to working in the public sector, but Jesus Christ, it's almost not worth it. Like seriously, I can't imagine working in a place where any little thing could get someone upset and now you have to deal with the headache of a person yelling at you, calling you all types of names, and you're just trying to work. And the rabbit hole of humans falling down this stupidity <laughs> is intense. Uh, we can't cover it all here because really we're still talking about go woke, go broke, which I actually haven't said at all in this whole video. So now we know that at least for Netflix, the streaming platform, Having woke employees and probably having woke material isn't really benefiting them in the long run. What about Hollywood in general? Is Hollywood affected by woke movies? And the short answer is no. Hollywood will push out whatever movie they want. And this is because Hollywood accounting is a thing. Hollywood accounting being a loophole and a financial part of developing movies to allow movies to be called a critical failure despite them making a bunch of money. And this is solely for the studio's benefit. We'll look at this video from Today I Found Out, who explains Hollywood accounting way better than I could. What's the deal with Hollywood accounting? Here's a fun fact for you to mull over. Despite having a clause in his contract that entitled him to a share of the total net profits of Return of the Jedi, David Prowse didn't get so much as a single thin cent from Lucasfilm from this because on paper, Return of the Jedi then until today has been a massive financial failure. Well, it's all thanks to a wonderful concept known colloquially as Hollywood accounting or more accurately, how to lose friends and screw people. Perhaps best showing how it's impossible to make money in Hollywood is the case of Forrest Gump, one of the most critically acclaimed and successful movies ever made which cost $55 million to make. Despite this relatively low figure, unfortunately for executives at Paramount Studios, it never turned a profit after grossing nearly $700 million at the box office. How and why are they doing this? As to the former question of how do they do it, well they have countless tricks up their sleeves, but one of the biggest ones is simply making separate companies for the various projects and as 
aspects of promotion and production. This is important because the studio or sub company can then charge the other company for its own services, essentially paying itself to produce and distribute the movie. So now you know what Hollywood accounting is. And if you don't, check out the full video from today I found out about Hollywood accounting. So basically, even though you have movies like Ghostbusters that did abysmal, the studio still makes money. Using this fact, part of the losses from an actual box office bomb can be moved to a film that they made a ton of money on, thus making the box office bomb help reduce profits from the successful film, again, all in order to ensure every project possible loses money on paper. So the people who are really losing out, the people who are really suffering, are the woke people making those movies. They're the ones who lose out on the most money. Naturally, because most studios can be fairly confident that their accountants will figure out a way to make sure most films they release will lose money on paper, they can use the sweet allure of a share of a film's net profits to hoodwink unsuspecting creative types, tricking actors, directors, writers, and producers into signing onto a project for less money than they ordinarily would by giving them a percentage of the net profit, knowing full well that they'll never have to pay anything out. Which I guess is poetic by some nature, that they're the ones who are standing against what they think is oppressive. But at the end of the day, they're the ones being manipulated. Now, don't get me wrong. It's not like woke movies in general aren't popular. Just because a bunch of people on the internet complain about them. Like, look, let's look at Captain Marvel here. Where it made $1.2 billion. There's still a general casual audience as long as the IP is strong enough. Hollywood themselves are not suffering from making woke movies at all. There's no money to be lost there because they're already stealing the money anyway. So next time you go on a pirate movie, don't feel too bad about it. The people who made the movie were already robbed. So Hollywood isn't really suffering from the wokeism, but there is another side of entertainment that is, and that's comic books. Kelly Sue DeConnick once said this about comic books. And if you don't like my politics, don't buy my book. Problem solved. And now here she is. I tend to be pretty optimistic, but in this one, I'm worried. I'm straight worried. Why? Uh, independent comic sales are down. And if you don't like my politics, don't buy my book. Uh, and independent books making back the cost of doing floppies is... Uh, like, names that should be able to do it, no sweat, are... are going into the red on singles but and not coming out until the trades and if you don't like my politics don't buy my book problem solved comic books have been spiraling down the hill that is political correctness and unfortunately they've been hitting every single rock down the way they've been pushing social issues so hard that it comes off as jarring maybe some of you guys remember this the new warriors and how it was critically laughed at by everyone on the internet so the first character that we're introduced to is Trailblazer. She's a group home and foster kid. We picked the name Trailblazer because she's somebody who charges into action. She knows that she can do some good with this you know, mysterious gift that she's been given. Screen Time is a internet kid taken to its sort of logical conclusion. As a youth, he was exposed to his grandfather's experimental internet gas, and that has patched him permanently into the World Wide Web. Snowflake and Safe Space are the twins, and their names are very similar to screen time. It's this idea that these are terms that get thrown around on the internet that they don't see as uh, derogatory to take those words and kind of wear them as badges of honor. Snowflake is non-binary and goes by they, them. E-negative is the goth kid. When he was a baby, he got a rogue life-saving blood transfusion, we assume from Michael Morbius. Every New Warriors comic has always felt like a reflection of the, the year that it came out. And uh, I don't think we're worried about being dated. I think we're way more interested about it being now. So you have something like the New Warriors created and they look absolutely stupid. The names are silly and ridiculous and the writer seems to be woefully unaware that they aren't creating a meta narrative on the names that the characters are even based on. Instead, adapting the characters as face value what those words are. And this is an article from TheMedium.com. Marvel ditches creativity to appeal to the woke crowd. Watch out DC, Marvel has unleashed their social justice league. When Jack Kirby and Stan Lee introduced Black Panther, their first black superhero, in the Fantastic Four in 1966 during the height of the civil rights movement, the character wasn't merely a mouthpiece for the disenfranchised blacks at the time. He came equipped with a rich history and defined traits. 
He was a scientist from a technologically advanced African nation, a far cry from the way blacks were normally portrayed in pop culture during that period. When Chris Claremont fleshed out the existing female characters and created new ones during the women's liberation movement of the 1970s and 80s, he didn't simply make an advertisement for feminism. He made characters like Storm, Jean Grey, Rogue, Psylocke, Mariko Yashida, Kitty Pride, and Mystique. Strong, flawed, funny, insecure, determined, and conflicted, making them feminist without making them feminist. Despite plenty of questionable creative choices over the years, Marvel has actually done a great job in creating characters from underrepresented populations and making them transcend their stereotypes by treating them with the same respect given to all of their other characters. I'm going to stop here real quick. This is exactly why I don't like things that are quote unquote diverse, things that are intended to be diverse on purpose, because you've taken away the important aspect of being a person and whittled it down to, well, they're gay or they're black or they're whatever, and that's important. You know, we as people all have the same destination, death, regardless of our sex, gender, or whatever. And in this next paragraph, I think it even dives deeper into why that's important. They prove that characters' superficial characteristics, their race, gender, sexuality, etc., didn't matter. It was their personalities, their values, their choices, their abilities that mattered. Today, however, it seems whenever Marvel tries to introduce characters that represent a group currently considered marginalized, they produce a product that's little more than an embodiment of talking points surrounding that group. There's no art. There's no subtlety applied to their admittance into the Marvel Universe. On the surface, this move by Marvel seems like a cynical attempt to placate the Twitter mobs who have made it as their raison d'etre, who constantly bitch about the lack of diversity, inclusion, and representation in every new piece of pop culture. And it may very well be, but I think the problem is deeper and more troubling than that. It's a sign of a once innovative company that has given up on taking risks with originality firmly planted in the future and has taken up staying just behind the times as his new standard practice. Despite being only a few years old, the terms safe space and snowflakes are already tired cliches and the light speed momentum of social media culture. Their use here is too late for relevance and too soon for nostalgia and right on time for absurdity. But again, sometimes these things can be successful because there is a casual audience for them. We can look at I'm Not Starfire, for example, which was almost able to get into the top 100 of young adult comic books. And this isn't including manga, this is nowhere near manga sales. Manga shits on comics every single time, no matter what. <laughs> and, and rightfully so. If you guys ever want to read through of I'm That Starfire, I've read through the whole thing, um, funny enough. And it's pretty bad, to be honest. It isn't for me, I can acknowledge that, that it's not aimed towards me. But it makes the same faux pas that all other woke things tend to do, where they don't know their audience. I realize that a story about a girl growing up under her cheerful mother isn't meant for me. Jesus Christ could they have fooled me with the way the characters talk and stuff. It's a generally bad piece of media, so I would love, if you guys want, I could read through it, we could do a little read through video. Because it's interesting, I'm not saying the story is interesting, but it's like interesting to see like something like this exist at all for any reason and it was approved. The art's pretty nice though. So now some closing thoughts. I think that woke culture is pretty bad in general. And when I say woke culture, I'm talking about the exaggeration of performative activism. People who believe that having a Muslim character, having a black character, or having gay characters, having a trans character will make them look more diverse, make their stories be appealing to more groups of people who are of that nature. What does woke mean? It means your brain is open, you're open to stuff, mm -hmm. you're- The problem is there's no real quantification. But wokeness? Yeah. Anybody can claim to be a master of wokeness. It's like kung fu without fighting. No, no I one's hear you. defined what's woke and what's preposterous. What's just not racist and not sexist and not homophobic, but open-minded and aware of the, the, the failings and the misgivings of all sides, all right. of us, and, and with no bias. There's no real clear understanding of like what makes and constitutes someone being woke. Like, yeah, how many of those boxes do you have to check? Right. At the end of the day, good stories are appreciated by everyone. People are able to relate with well-written characters, the ones that seem human. I know a black person exists, that's fine. As a kid, I always looked up to Peter Parker. Way before Miles Morales even came around, I looked up to Peter Parker, I related to Peter Parker, I empathized with Peter Parker. He was who I was. 
Heroes like that are the ones that are the best. The ones that we're able to see ourselves in without having to look at the superficial nature of the character. Those things are important to people on an individual basis. I'm relieved that Hollywood is taking a step back at what they see as only a trend to make money. Because that's what it is at the end of the day. They see people on Twitter and they think of them as nothing more than wallet. But I mean, what company doesn't at this point? But it's sad to think that the people who fall for this, who say, oh my god, there's a black character here, so I'll watch it solely because there's a black character, that you're nothing more than being used by these companies. They don't care. Same way how people were eating up shitty Michael Bay movies with his hardcore action and hot babes. The same thing is happening here. Once they find out that people just want the other flavor again, they're going to switch right back to that. Now, personally, I don't feel too bad since it seemed like Netflix was giving priority to stories that weren't proven, stories that felt like they just came out of a Tumblr page, to be honest. But now those woke individuals won't be able to get their mediocre stories told because Netflix was following the flow of culture at the time. And if I could give any parting words, I would definitely say if you want your thing to become big, like on a Netflix or a Hollywood movie, I think you're going to have to prove yourself. Just, this is my old man, my old man advice. I'm not that old, but my old man advice is you're going to have to prove yourself on another social media platform. The days of throwing millions of dollars at noobs off of Tumblr, those days are over. It's over. It's, it's not going to happen anymore. The Uno reverse card has been played and they're not just throwing money at people anymore. So, And this is something I've said with the High Guardian Spice videos I made. It wasn't a proven concept. It was solely going off. We're diverse. And that's not enough. It's flimsy at best, abysmal at worst. I feel Hollywood has tried their shot with we can sell diversity and it's worked for the most part because there is now a culture of people who believe that a diverse media by diverse product is good solely because it's diverse. So I mean they've already done some good cultural damage if anything. At least I would call it damage. I think people who think oh yeah this is good because XYZ nebulous XYZ reason I think has done harm to our society and how we consume media. Again, that's not to say that the opposite side of the spectrum will make perfect media all the time because that's just not the case either. But for sure, most things that will be labeled as woke media tend to be pretty bad. And if it's not bad, then it can't be called woke. I'm curious, but at the same time worried where media goes from here. I'm not one to say that I just want again to be in an era where we have gritty white dude, uh, Chris Pratt I guess, on every single movie poster. I do want different types of people, but I don't want that to be the sole focus of it. At times like this, I wish I was a smarter person or at least could delve deeper into like the information that's stuck in my head to really jot down my, uh, my thoughts. But I just wanted to put a video out there since I haven't done one in almost three goddamn weeks and maybe it has been three weeks. So I'm sorry about that. Things have gotten busy. I'll be busy for the next six weeks. I'll try to pump out videos if I can every weekend. Not every weekend, probably every two weeks. I'm not even going to commit to every weekend. <laughs> That's a dangerous thought. But I'll definitely post videos more often. I I'm sorry about that. This was supposed to come out like right after the other one, but things just started spiraling out of control. I just thought to myself, well, it's better to just have time to actually make a video for real than force myself to make a video. Um, and that's that's for anyone too. never at any point force yourself to do something that's meant for the internet I think I think your health is far more important especially your mental health and physical health so always take care of yourself and I'll definitely see you next time